Just baseball show, as always, presented by BetMGM, Jack and Aram. Peter, a sick boy again. Get it together, Mr. Apple. Today, Friday, June 14th, we got to talk about JT Real Muto hitting the shelf. Kevin Biggio finding a new home. Wasn't a great first impression. A. Eugenio Suarez getting kind of phased out. It's fascinating. Then a prospect report will wrap with hitters of the week and games of the weekend. Two things off the top. We want to talk about the Reds kid, the streaker at Great American yeah. Ballpark. Although I, I need you to help me define the word streaker. We'll get to that in a moment. On the Just Baseball show, I have a football question for you. Did okay. you did you see that the Falcons got dinged for tampering with Kirk Cousins? I saw that it was like a possibility. So it, it's a fine. They forfeit a fifth round pick. It's like a $250,000 fine. The GM got fined 50 grand. My question to you is this. You, you tampered with your nine-figure free agent quarterback and you still drafted one in the first round. Like, can you help explain this to me? I Again, I'm not that big of an NFL head. I just don't really understand the thought process behind that. Well, and, and like the tampering part's funny because it's like how many how many people were lining up to give Kirk Cousins like what was it like two hundred million dollars? I think like so. That? So yeah, yeah, that, that part's funny. I, I'm glad we don't have like the the tampering thing much in baseball. Like NBA and NFL, you hear it all the time, and yeah. I think it would it would be so annoying <laughs> if we had that aspect in in baseball. Although if there was like tampering in baseball, if they started to crack down on like international free agency and stuff oh. like that, oh man, uh, that's not even tampering. That's kind of a different beast, but. No, I have no idea how that's possible. I also that things like that make me realize how little maybe I know about other sports relative to baseball, because like, I think if that was baseball, I feel like I could find a way to to understand that and make that make sense. Like, okay, you you desperately wanted a quarterback. You paid him a trillion dollars and still tampered to, to get him. And then you also drafted a quarterback in the first round. Right. Um, right. That Again, I, that really shows me like there's, there's so much nuance to every sport and, uh, I'm glad we we have a decent feel for it in baseball, but man, there, these other sports now, there's times where I'm like, I, I feel like I've never known less. Uh, I just, it, it, that's how I feel. I'm just trying to like figure out what it, what the comp could be. It's like, Hey, you sign what Cody Bellinger. Let, let's use Correa. For example, you signed Carlos Correa to a two year deal at 35 per. So he gets two for 70 or three for 90. Cause it was a longer term commitment to cousins. But then you take like the most big league ready shortstop you can possibly find in the top five. It, it's like the Nats signing a center fielder for three years, 90 million, and then taking Cruz second. You know, why would you do that? Or not even, like, yeah, it, it, it's even, I would almost say you could say it's like five years because it's different in football where like you're immediately being thrusted into the fold. So yeah, it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, it's weird, but I also like, it's so hard to compare across sports. Yeah, so we're not going to do it. We're going to talk about a court hearing instead. Yes. And it's not for anybody really notable, kind of a flash in the pan, five minutes of fame thing. But the five minutes of fame was awesome. And the photos that we got from Tuesday night at Great American Ballpark, and I don't have the kid's name. If you can find the kid's name, that would be awesome. But we had a fan run out of the field. And I do need to ask your definition of streaker, because when I hear the word streaking, I think unclothed. But yeah. this kid fully clothed in a gray Cincinnati Reds jersey that was sick, by the way, gets on the field, does a backflip, running away from a cop, gets tased, and gets taken off. Court hearing the next morning, judge says, you know, a lot of people on social media are saying that you landed the backflip. And he said, I'm pretty sure I did. Yeah. That was awesome. I, I never really care about, about people running on the field, but that whole situation i think was as unique as it as it comes and i was just think in in his jersey at at the court hearing you're saying yeah. like oh i think i did just <laughs> that was one of that was one of the colder lines i've i've have heard but uh also like getting tased on cameras pretty absurd um right. that's also really funny and nailing a backflip too like uh -huh. across the board i mean if you're gonna do it like i think running on the field is the dumbest thing you can do because just auto jail and getting banned or you know fines and just not worth the headache but if you're going to do it, like get your money's worth. And I think this is one of the more successful, I think. what what What's the alternative word if it's not streaker? I I don't know. It, like, because it's not streaker. Streaker, the Merriam, like Webster dictionary definition would be. Is naked. 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 Right. So I, I, what would be the, what would be the word? Just, I, I don't know. Running on the field. 
His name is William Hendon, by the way, 19 year old William Hendon. Good for you. Photo 19. of the year. Him getting tased in the back was the photo of the year. Like so good, man. And the fact that he was like positive morale the morning after was elite. Uh, I wish I wish Tops now would make a card for that. Oh, yeah. Like the Liz McGuire thing. Yeah. But it's it's getting tased and tongue out. Like I, I'll pull up the photo on the iPad. I'm looking but at it right now. It's I think it's I think it's. Like in soccer, they called it pitch invader. So like field invader, ballpark invader, that kind of thing. For the YouTube crowd, this is the photo <laughs> of the year in Major League Baseball. And he's just screaming with the two Tays just coming right into his back. So absolutely love that. Uh, William Hendon, big fan of your work, man. I think I can confidently say I'll go the rest of my life without ever getting tased. I feel pretty good about those chances. I don't know. We'll we'll see how crazy your 40s get, man. <laughs> Don't rule it out. Um, we got to talk about JT Realmuto, who is getting closer to 40, and we can kind of see it with his knees. JT Realmuto had surgery to remove some excess cartilage in his knee, some floating cartilage, I think, in his knee. Uh, surgery will have him out for about a month. They think it's going to be around the All-Star break that he comes back. Rob Thompson's confident that it'll be right around the All-Star break, maybe just after the All-Star break, but... The Philadelphia Phillies need to weather the storm for a month with Garrett Stubbs and Raphael Marchand as their catching tandem. Good luck, fellas. I, I think they can do it. You know, I, this is where it's great that you got off to such a good start. Yeah. You're 10 games up on the Braves. The Braves have way more issues than their catcher at that point. And I think, you know, Stubbs, the one part is that that's nice is like – if they had a bit of a turnstile, uh, I think of like backup catchers and and Stubbs hasn't been there for three plus years, I'd be more concerned. You know, you're thrusting a guy into the fold, working with a bunch of veteran arms that you know have been really cruising and you're going to shake it up on them a little bit. That's not going to be the case here. Like Stubbs can't really swing it. He did have that like out of body experience in 2022 for a little bit, but yeah. I, I don't think they really need him to swing it with the way that they're playing. So I, I think it works out all right for them to stay afloat and be fine because of the fact that, you know, Stubbs has been there for three years. I think there's plenty of comfort with him there uh, and, and he'll be able to just kind of hold it down in the meantime. It is huge that it's not more than a few months though. Like if it was, you know, Hey, we're looking at September, then I'd start to get concerned. Cause then by the time he even comes back, he's not going to have time to get his feet back under him quite literally and, and get rolling again, offensively and, and defensively. I'm sure it's going to be a bit of a process just to get comfortable in the squat and move around the same way. Again, he's a very athletic catcher. So I think the fact that he can come back early here, right around the all-star break, like you said, even if it's a little bit later than that has plenty of time to get his, his legs back under him, get some momentum going again and, and be ready for the postseason. I'm not too worried in the grand scheme. It is, it is a unfortunate blow, but this is where it's really nice to have that, uh, that comfort and buffer that you have over the rest of the NL East. They have, um, kind of hit a snag when it comes to injuries they, like a lot of guys are hitting the shelf right now and even if they're not there are some guys that are day-to-day -day. as we speak right now on Thursday afternoon Edmundo Sosa is day-to-day -day. he was out of the lineup on Wednesday it was a little groin tweak Rob Thompson said um, but he shouldn't hit the IL um, Trey Turner I saw it looks like he will be activated next week during the homestand there's a chance that it happens in Baltimore but that's unlikely. And then Brandon Marsh, he didn't make the trip to London. We saw photos of him rehabbing it at, uh, at Lehigh Valley. By the way, he was wearing a tank. Did you see his arms? No. That dude has put in weight room work, Brandon it's Marsh. Hard. He's sneaky, hits the ball hard. I mean, man, like he's a big boy now. Um, Marsh started a rehab with AA Redding on Wednesday. So you've got Turner and Marsh geared up to return in the next week or so. Uh, Rio Muto is now like the big notable absence you've got. But again, like if you have one hole and, you know, you're plugging it with the clubhouse guy of all clubhouse guys, is, it feels like Stubbs and Austin Hedges are the two yeah. like elite clubhouse guys in Major League yeah. Baseball. Uh, I think they're going to be just fine here. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I mean, you know, a team is doing really well when you almost forget the guys that they have out like I, I almost forget sometimes that Trey Turner is is, yeah. is not playing at, at the moment and I almost forget sometimes that you know they're operating without Brandon Marsh and that's because they're doing so well you know when a team is struggling then you start to say oh man we could really use this player we could really use that player uh we need him back ASAP uh I, I think 
that's just a testament to what the Phillies are doing right now. And the fact that they're going to get Turner back soon, yeah. kind of to offset the loss of Real Muto. It's right. unfortunate to have that, like, you know, it feels like almost one step forward and then one step back. But if, if you're going to have someone go down, at least you have someone coming back and, and really two guys coming back, as you mentioned. So net positive, I think, by the time we get to uh, about a, a week or two from here. The other thing, man, like you can ignore the fact that Alec Bohm after the May that he had, uh, or after the April that he had, pardon, 26 games in May, a 648 OPS, nine games in June, a 470 OPS. Again, Whoa. you forget that Turner's hurt. You forget that Bohm has been that brutal over the last month and a half because yeah. they're the Phillies, man, and they're pitching their way to 50 wins. And Bryce Harper's slugging his way to 50 wins. And Schwarber is hitting the first pitch of the game out at it's Fenway. June. It's June, like June Schwarber is here. So you don't have to worry about the struggles of Alec Bohm or the, or the absence of Turner in Rio Muto or, you know, the Wednesday that you don't have Edmundo Sosa. It, it is really impressive what they have going on right now. And I, again, like two years ago, the word depth and the Philadelphia Phillies did not jive. But no. here we go. They've got just enough depth in that lineup. And it's not even bench pieces. You have just enough depth in that lineup to survive, you know, some really notable injuries. Yep, totally. Kevin Biggio uh, provides depth, and the Dodgers are going to do something a little unorthodox with Kevin Biggio when you look at the grand scheme of his career. He made his Dodger debut on Wednesday night, had a costly air at third in that one. Um, he was, you know, so-so. He had a one-for-three day at the dish. But Kevin Biggio, 44 games at Toronto, hit an even 200, a 614 OPS. What they're doing that is unique, Kevin Biggio, Dave Roberts said, is going to play third base against right-handed pitching while Max Muncy is out. Kevin Biggio played one game at third base in 2022. In 23, he played 13 games with six starts at third base. This guy really hasn't played third base over the last several years. And here we go. The Dodgers are running him out with Mookie Betts at shortstop. And <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I saw Chris Rose mentioned to uh, Stephen Brault when he had him on the uh, Rose rotation. Hey, what do you do with Mookie? Do you put him back in the outfield? Do you have him play shortstop? Like, again, the metrics have not been great for Mookie Betts. So now you have a left side of the infield where Biggio's in an uncomfy spot. Betts is in an uncomfy spot. The Dodgers are trying to figure something out right now. And it's, it's weird to say that with the L.A. freaking Dodgers, but they are. Well, and this goes back to the the conversation that we we had initially. Like it's it's amazing that Mookie's been able to hold it down at short, and it's a testament to what kind of freak of an athlete he is. But I do worry, like as the season progresses. I mean, that's the their center field, and of course catcher, but that's a different story. But there in center field are some of the more wear and tear, exhausting positions that you're going to play. And the initial conversation that was being had with Mookie is how can we preserve him? How can we make sure that it's easiest on his back? And then you end up having to move him to shortstop now. So I, I do feel like they need to look for outside help, not as an indictment on Mookie. Again, he could hold it down all year if you wanted, but if you want to set yourself up for success, I think for the rest of the year, and also just have a better defensive shortstop overall, uh, I think it's twofold there. You have someone's picking it better on, on, the, on the left side, and you also have Mookie preserved a bit more. Who, If you're going to win a World Series, you need Mookie swinging it like an MVP or at least close to it. Uh, you need... Freddie to do the same and you need Otani to do the same, but you you don't have to worry about any other factors with those guys. So I, I, I don't really love the idea of Mookie playing shorts up all year. And I'm glad you brought that up. And I think that the Kevin Biggio side of it is interesting, but then you're going to put Muncy back there. It's not like he's, you know, a wizard defensively either. They can go get a shortstop if they need one. Uh, we know that they can do that. And, and I'm, I'm interested to see like who could be on the market. It, it could be something that's smaller. It could be a Paul DeYoung type. That yep. maybe just allows you to have somebody playing good defense at short. And you know that they love to pick those types up too and do things like that. And I think they've literally done in the past. So uh, that's my one thing. Like I know this is a Kevin Biggio conversation, but it, it does kind of end up sprawling to something wider. But I, I also just think it's interesting that I, I'm fascinated by such a forward thinking team. And I'm not saying it's wrong. It's more of like causing me to maybe think a little bit more or take a different perspective on something. I'm very fascinated by how forward thinking of a team the Dodgers are and how little they're really worried about their infield defense right now, especially on the left side. Like yeah. that, that is just a very fascinating thing to me. Cause you'd think, you know, some of the more analytically driven teams would put a lot of, you know, emphasis and a lot of value into that. And uh, the last thing I'll mention on my long winded point is like Kevin Biggio booted a ball and you know, we're biased, obviously we're rooting for Walker, but like then Walker ends up having a battle a little bit more. And what happens? Corey Seager hits a three run shot. So like, 
that, that's an anecdotal piece, but you know, for whatever reason, the Dodgers feel as though the defensive aspect maybe is not that important right now, knowing that they can rectify it down the line and it's more important to, to slug. I don't know. Like that, that's what it almost makes me want to dive into that deeper. Well, and one of Bueller's last starts, his last road start was in Pittsburgh, and it was, what, three very early airs. It was one of the worst defended games that I've seen from a Major League Baseball team this year. And it came from the L.A. Dodger infield. The right side, like, that's not much of a problem. I thought Lux has really held his own over at second base. You know, he knocked down a couple of rockets yesterday, and I, I've seen him make good amount of, like, very strong plays at second base. Yeah, so the throwing was the problem. The throwing was the problem. He can get to really anything at second base. And, you know, Freddie's Freddie. There's not going to be any change there. But you think, you know, put Mookie Betts back in a position where he can be one of the most valuable defenders in the sport in a corner instead of a place where he has the 13th worst fielding run value in Major League Baseball. Do you know who the worst defender in baseball is by fielding run value? Infielder, outf- uh, infielder I assume. Uh, infield, third base. Third NL, base. NL third baseman. NL third baseman worse by fielding run value. Um, when I say it, you're gonna be like, of course. NL central. NL central. Uh oh, Morel. Morel. Yeah, they they need to figure that shit out too, man. I I mean, dude, it's crazy. But he's got a negative eight fielding run value cool. in Major League Baseball right now. That's the worst. You've got four guys in a negative seven: Camposano, Benintendi, Luis Arise, Starling Marte, and a couple of guys at negative six. And Mookie Betts is clumped here with Jamer Candelario, with Brian Reynolds, with Spencer Steer at negative five. Like Mookie Betts should never be near the bottom of fielding run value, regardless of where you put him. But that's what happens when you take a right fielder and put him at shortstop. And and I know he's held his own, but like holding your own and being good are are two very different things and they could maximize Mookie's value. And I I am not sure that this is maximizing Mookie's value. And I don't think Miguel Rojas is the full-time answer, but I'm with you. It might be a Paul DeYoung. Last thing on the Dodgers, could it be a Trey Sweeney in a timeshare? I'm worried he'd get blown up a little bit if he gets up there. Fair, uh, it's fair. not like That's he's a wizard defensively. Yeah, but possible. I Very possible. Like, he could be a guy that plugs in for a little bit. He has been swinging it better. Uh, it's a, there's, I think there's a reason why they made that move, you know, just as that, like, stopgap plug in someone that can fill in there. So I wouldn't rule it out at all. Because Vivas couldn't. Like, Vivas could not play shortstop at the major Vivas league. could not play shortstop, no. And I think that's part of the reason why they made that swap. So I, I wouldn't be shocked at all. Um, I'm worried that you might get blown up a little bit offensively, but, you know, if you want to try it, there's no reason not to. Yeah, and I mean, is he going to get blown up to the same level that Miguel Rojas is? Is Rojas doing real bad now? I think so. He was doing all right in the beginning. I haven't checked on the Miggy Road numbers. Please don't. Uh, oh, they're good. Are you they good hater. right now? You hate her. 112 WRC plus. Wow. Look at Miguel Rojas in 139 games. He had a 612 last year. He played 124 games. I'm surprised they don't give him more run at short, though. Like, why not? I mean, he can pick it. You know that. That's the one thing he's he's pretty darn good for at all times. He's played 22 games at short. I mean, so it's, I guess, decent amount of run. Maybe they they keep ticking that up a little bit. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, last guy that I want to talk about is in that same division here, Eugenio Suarez. And, and you really want to talk about him. You texted and said, we got to talk about Eugenio <laughs> Suarez. I'll let you kind of lay out what's happening. What's going on in Arizona? Because Arizona, quite frankly, is a team that, you know, I'll tune into. Obviously, Gallon's hurt right now, but I would tune into for Gallon starts. I'll occasionally check on the FOT start. But right now, like, they're just not drawing my attention to watch a game in real time. Like, what's happening here? I mean, you know, we've talked about the Corbin Carroll struggles, and you can't really pin it on him too much because I think you got to look at the rest of this team and, a lot of guys that are just not holding up their end of the bargain. Like you went out and got Eugenio Suarez to hold down third and, and slug, and he's not really doing either. Um, I, I even look at a Lourdes Gurriel who's been coming on of late a little bit more, but I mean, that's a guy that you brought back to be a, a you, you basically wanted to pencil those guys in a 750 OPS at the very least. And, you know, you feel very good about that. And the rest of the guys will, 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 you know, push you across the finish line, the Christian walkers, even the Jock Petersons who've been swinging. And of course, the Corbin Carroll could tell Marte, like those are the guys that you expect to, to take you over, but you need that baseline. And I felt like Guriel was that baseline. I felt like going out to get Suarez was that baseline. And unfortunately Suarez has just been a disaster. 
And I, even when I watch him, man, and I know some of some of the way that his his game goes is like he he is kind of that nonchalant guy, and sometimes those nonchalant looking guys, you you in it, it almost implies that they don't care, but sometimes that's not fair. And yeah. I'm not saying that he doesn't, but when a guy's not performing and you have that nonchalant aspect, it's it, pretty it becomes easy more to point at you. Yeah, it becomes more frustrating. Yeah. And and to me, I see a veteran, 33 years old, struggling and not really caring enough to to make much of a change and that is maybe presumptive on my end but it kind of felt validating to that presumption when you start to see blaze alexander get more run remember they're they're paying suarez like he, he's getting paid this year and he's getting paid after this year too and when you saw a report come out i forget who who had mentioned it but the report came out that the the d-backs would be open to potentially moving off of suarez i'm sure you would but good luck uh yeah. because yeah it's 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 a club option next year so at the end of the day it, I'm sure there's a buyout, yeah. Yeah. but at the end of the day, like maybe there's a bad contract swap or something that they can, that they can do, but that was telling a little bit. And then now you, you go and look at a blaze Jordan who has not really played a ton of third and you know, Alexander. he's been real, or not sorry, George, Jordan, Jordan, Jordan just came back by the way. Dogs. Yeah. I saw he that. Just made a return. That was awesome. Um, So I'm, I'm happy for him. He's obviously in the back of my head right now, Uh, but blaze Alexander like has not played a lot of short or sorry. He's not played a lot of third and, and now you're moving him there and, and getting him more reps there. I think that's saying something about where they're at with a Eugenio Suarez. And I think they probably feel if they're going to go this year, if they're going to do anything, it's probably going to be because somebody else plugged in there and helped them and not because a Eugenio Suarez turned things around. So I just wanted to talk about him because I feel like we're kind of seeing in real time that the D-backs are already out of patience with him, which is wild already on June, on June 13th, given that he's just joined the team this year. So like that to me says that there might be more going on. And again, it's it's speculative, but it's just surprising to see a team that went out to get this guy. They're paying him a lot of money and so quick to phase him out. I think that says something. He's making a bit over $11 million this year. He's got a club option at 15, which includes a $2 million buyout. So it would be, you know, $2 million. Thank you for your services. Here's a check. Um, go take a look at your chase. I'm sure you're really happy about that. But um, this guy, like, it, it's kind of crazy to me that, he signed this six-year, $66 million deal with Cincinnati, and he's been moved twice at this yep. point. And it's been like, fine. And, you know, it, it by no means have I heard anything that said, oh, negative clubhouse presence or anything like that. I think this is just a guy whose contract is palatable. There was value that was seen there. You also have to acknowledge that this guy in what, three of the last four full seasons, he has led his league in strikeouts. Like he's, yep. he's going to punch out all the time. And when you're hitting 49 homers, like you do in 19, it's no problem. Hell, like when you hit 31 homers, like you did in 22, that's no problem. But when you're hitting a buck 97 and you're not slugging, that's a massive problem. And again, that can make those mannerisms scream negative negativity, like even more, you know what I mean? A hundred percent. And you know, just kind of building off of that. Now I look at the D backs and, you know, we were excited about the fact that they were pushing the chips forward and and spending and, and investing into a team that had made that impressive run. That said, you know, and in hindsight's obviously 2020. Yeah. I love the Montgomery signing. There's no, there's no I I would have done the same thing. Yes. Didn't on paper, I like the idea of them going out to it was more I was happy that they were spending when they went out and got Eduardo Rodriguez because you figured he's a net positive whether he's worth the deal or not. Unfortunately, he's been hurt and, and you can't, you can't blame them too much for that. But when you look at that, like those two players, they add jock has been a great signing so far. That that's great. But you know, yeah. that's, that's a low jock impact Grichip, move. Jock and, jock and Grichip co combining in that DH spot. It was very hard Yui. for me to say for some reason, jock and Grichip. Jock and Grichip. I mean, it's pretty tough. It is. Tough. Uh, but then bringing back Guriel, like, has there been a team that's had a more disastrous off season free agency wise? No, I don't think so. And I'm not I, faulting anybody. Like again, I think some of the moves we liked them in the moment, but now just looking at it, it's gone is about as terribly as it possibly could. Right, and and it stinks because Arizona is optically a smaller market team in Major League Baseball. We don't view the Diamondbacks as a team that are gonna spend big, and now I think this type of season on the heels of a World Series run on the heels of a big off season to try and get back to the fall classic, like it blowing up in their face like this 
almost disincentivizes small markets. It's like, well, look at Arizona. They tried spending to get back there yeah. and they fell flat on their face. Um, I know Jordan Montgomery already fired Boris, but I mean, this is like the disaster of the year. I, I stand by that. I think I'll stand by that for the rest of the year. Jordan Montgomery should, I, I don't know if there's a way for him to, I don't really stick it to his former agent, but he mishandled this so badly yep. for his former client. Yep. I, I cannot believe what is going on with Jordan Montgomery and Blake Snell right now. And I think it's very clear, especially a guy in Jaymont that's just been a model of consistency. I think Snell, you could say, oh, well, you know, he's always volatile and you know things can happen. He's been, but it's it's been, you know, physical with, with, with Snell too. Montgomery has been consistent. And the only thing that's been different for him this year has been the time to prepare in spring training. That tactic that Scott Boris is so long loved to use. And remember, JD's swinging it well now, but JD really had a tough time getting yeah. himself into game shape and, and was struggling with a lot of, you know, body soreness. These are all guys on the other side of 30 that he's doing it with too, of course, because that's how baseball free agency works. But that's an important note, especially on the JD side. This is a tactic that now I think can only blow back in his face. His clients aren't going to want to do it because they're going to see that. And even if their clients are, his clients are confident enough and maybe silly enough to, to be willing to, to hold out that way. Teams are going to call that bluff all day long. Say, okay, yeah, you, you want to, you want to hold out. This is our best offer. Go ahead and hold out. How'd that work for your guys last time around? Yeah. And I, I think that's, that's something that is probably good because it, it's silly. Like I don't like how much it gets dragged out. I don't want to see these guys struggle, but it might be a necessary evil for, this stupid tactic to yeah. stop happening because Boris is the only guy that does it too. Like it's mm -hmm. really only a Boris thing. So I'm glad that this will probably be the last we see of it. And if the two parties, two parties being player and Boris are, are dumb enough to do this again next year, whoever he's representing, then I think, you know, they're signing up for a, a, a lot of frustration. And, and, and I think, you know, they're, they're putting themselves at a disadvantage right away. And especially when you ultimately don't even get the deal that you wanted, it, there's oh, there's so much more risk than reward in that type of approach to free agency, I think. What was Arietta's holdout? Do you remember Arietta's holdout where he was he arrived like very late in spring training? I just remembered Arietta got there super late and was very disappointing for Philly. And I just remembered like Oh yeah, that's right. He was a Boris client too. He's probably the best example on the pitching side. I don't know if I remember. Is it I don't know if I remember. But 18, he put together a great year. I'm not sure which So one 2018, shortly before opening day, Jake Arrieta signed a three-year $70 million deal with additional options up to $135 million. The late signing prevented Arietta from being named to the opening opening day 25-man roster. But so he had a good year though that year in, in 18. It was a three nine on the heels of a one seven, then a three, yeah. then a three one, then a three five. So like it was okay. It was okay. But he was 32 at that point. Yeah. I mean, I, I just remember thinking that was very stupid that he held out for that long. And now it's actually blowing up in these guys' faces. And you yeah. know, it might just be more finicky clients in in J Mont and Snell, but it's blowing up in their faces. So yep. We're going to get to the prospect report here in a moment, but before that, quick break. Mr. Layton, your prospect report, pretty please. Uh, you're going to help me on this one, though. Uh, that's so that, that's the fun part. Is, uh, <laughs> this is my first two... prospect report that I think I've ever been on, actually. I think you do it with Peter, and he's like, all right, floor is yours. Yeah, and I just go crazy. Uh, yeah. We're, we're going to just flutter around and then go over a bunch of different names and, and talk briefly about it and and see where we go. Uh, and then you can you can call you can call a timeout once we're once we've gone over enough players. But uh, I'll fly around and honestly, just like, let me know. We'll start with hitters. Just let me know when you want to chime in, because I'm going to start with Cole Carrig, Rockies prospect. Yeah. And we're going to mostly be, be looking at guys in June, how they've been performing. Uh, Cole Carrig was one of the breakout hitting prospects that we picked going into the year. One of the guys that I've really, really liked since the Rockies took him, made some swing adjustments that I was very pumped on. Switch hitter, plus plus speed, plays a good center field. They even give him a little bit of run at shortstop, which is fun. Uh, can can swipe bags, and he's just been red hot. Uh, over these 10 games so far in, in June, he's getting on base at a 540 clip. He's hitting 489. He's 1184 OPS, and he's been mashing pretty much over his last 30 games. He's probably going to get a double-A promotion soon. He's a guy that I've just been really high on and, and, and really excited about. Interested to see how he adjusts to the double-A level. Uh, Edgar Caro, 
who we've talked about a bit because he was traded from the Angels to the White Sox in that Lucas Giolito trade. Caro, a catcher in double A, got off to a slow start. Uh, this is his second taste of double A, but he was way too talented to be swinging it the way that he was in the first half. And he's a top 100 prospect for us for a reason. He's been a top 50, 60 guy for a while, uh, and he's had a ridiculous June as well, where he has a 14, 19 OPS in his last 10 games. He's homered three times, also has three doubles, five walks, six strikeouts. He's small, but a switch hitter that just gets to everything and will surprise you with a little bit of thump. Yeah. A Astros. Bryce Matthews. I feel like yeah. no one's talked about him because you know, he was more of a project first round pick last year. Figured it was going to be a little bit more of a process for him because it was tools over, over, you know, the polish, but Matthews and high a for the Astros has been just absurd. So not just the numbers over the last 10 games or so, where he has an OPS just under 1500, he's hit six home runs in his last nine games. He is absolutely crushing them though, too. I mean, this guy's EVs are our top flight. Uh, he can run. He's a great athlete. I, again, this was a guy that was seen as maybe a slower burn, more of a project. And I think we're starting to see it come together for him. The question is, is if he's going to hit enough, but he's, I think, cut down the swing and miss as much as ever. This guy's tooled up. And I, I think that there's a lot to dream on here. If Bryce Matthews, you know, can prove to to kind of maintain the the contact improvements that we've seen at the double A level as we move forward. But this is a guy that in, in that Astro system, I think could stand out very, very quickly with the tools and and with the power at shortstop where you know there, there's some concern that he might move off at third, but I think he has a decent chance to be able to stick there too with the athleticism in the arm. So Bryce Matthews is a former Nebraska Cornhusker. I saw mm -hmm. this note, um, second 2020 season in Big Ten baseball history. So he's wow. got power speed blend. I didn't realize it was that you know few and far between in a conference that, is not considered a power conference for baseball, but shout out the Nebraska Cornhuskers. Cade Povich, Spencer Schwellenbach started against each other at Camden Yards the other day. It's a good really day to be a Husker, huh? Really cool. Uh, I did, Povich did. looked awesome. Povich looked really good. That's crazy for the Orioles, too, if Povich is thrown like that. And Schwellenbach had a nice bounce back from, from a tough second big league start where I thought, you know, Schwellenbach held his own overall. Uh, Cooper Pratt, low mm -hmm. A for the Brewers. This was a, a sneaky get in last year's class. I thought the Brewers maneuvered the draft as well as anybody. And Cooper Pratt was a big part of that. Prepster, big projectable kid with big power potential, but also, you know, the question of, is he going to hit enough high schooler with big long levers? And so far he's, he's really started to settle in now in full season ball. He's hitting 472 on the month so far, uh, 500 on base OPS over a thousand. There's so much to dream on, though, in terms of the power potential there. So Pratt's really fun. And then the Yankees have a couple catchers that just continue to stand out. Ben Rice and Agustin Ramirez. Ben Rice is the guy we'll focus on here because I think he just got promoted to AAA as well, if I'm I not mistaken. So. Yeah, and he and homered in his first game in triple, I think. His swing is for real. And my question, I, I love the bat. When we did the Yankee system in the uh, on the call-up and, and ranked that for just baseball.com, Rice was a guy that was in the top 15 just off the bat. There was question of, of you know, the defensive ability. And, you know, the arm could be better. I, I do have some concern about how he can limit the running game. But the Yankees are one of the best in, in minor league baseball or, or just one of the best developmentally at framing and, and improving the framing and receiving of their catchers. And Rice has improved a ton in that regard and actually is a pretty pretty solid in that department so the fact that he is swinging it the way that he has which by the way in his last 10 games he's hit three home runs ops over 1300 and he has been mashing really all year long now the receiving has continued to get better i feel like they've almost found a, another version of austin wells I say, again i still i take wells ahead of him because i think wells is a little bit more well-rounded but they've developed rice into what seems like a very similar profile to that of of austin wells which is Really, really fun. And then Augustine Ramirez, that guy's just been crushing baseballs every other day. Absolutely pulverizing. And, and, and EV's over 110, 111, 112. I don't think he has as good of a chance of sticking behind the dish, but the, the bat is just ridiculous. And then a Red Sox guy. We're going to go to the rivals. Real quick. Campbell. Oh, yeah. Real quick. Can I hang out on Ben Rice for a moment? Absolutely. The background on Ben Rice is crazy. Like, absolutely insane. He was a Dartmouth guy. His mm -hmm. Freshman year at Dartmouth, 23 games, had a 776 OPS, right? Sophomore year at Dartmouth, 2020, COVID year. He played seven games. Then, 21, Ivy League doesn't have a baseball season. So oh, he yeah. doesn't play. 
His first playing time in 2021 came in Katuit, played 13 games in Katuit, 12th yeah. round pick of the Yankees out of the Cape Cod League and no Ivy League season. And this guy, since entering Pro Bowl in 220 minor league games, has a 930 OPS. He lost his draft year of college baseball, and now he's knocking on the door of the big leagues. That is a crazy resilient story. And I mean, that that's the cool thing with uh, we're still kind of seeing the residual effects of some of these stories. We just talked to, you know, a, a player that went to the Colorado School of Mines and and didn't get drafted in 2020, signed as an undrafted free agent. And, you know, he's about to to potentially get his big league opportunity with the Royals and Walter Pennington. So there, there's just so many amazing stories out of that and, and unfortunate stories as well when, when you have the 2020 season and for the Ivy League, the 2021 season bang the way it was. But Rice, even over his last, last 30 games, OPS over 1,000, 90th percentile exit velocity, by the way, on the year of 106. So, I mean, that's mm. plus power. And it's to the pull side. It'll play well on the short porch. I would not be surprised if, especially if there's an injury behind the dish, if if Ben Rice gets an opportunity sooner rather than later. A, a couple other bats before I wanted to go over a, a couple arms, and then Jack, feel free to add anyone that we might be might, might be missing. Christian Campbell just got the call up to, or the promotion up to Double A for the Red Sox organization, and joins that Portland club that you know, we, we've talked about is really really talented. Nick York got pushed up to Triple A, I think, more because of how good Christian Campbell's been and. They wanted to get him reps at second base in double A. Yeah. It's a unique swing. He played at Georgia Tech. Uh, I think I'm trying to remember what what round it was either third or fifth round that he was selected in, but he hits the living crap out of the ball. And what's been amazing is like every time I'm waiting for him to kind of come at that back down to earth, he doesn't. He just gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And his start in double A has been absurd. And so far, this sprinkles back into high A, but over his last 20 games, slashing 377, 473. 597. It's a 1,071 OPS, only a 17% strikeout rate and a 13% walk rate. Uh, again, there's some swing components that I, I am a little bit wary of, but it's really hard to argue against the results and how much he's impacting the baseball. I was diving into some video yesterday just to kind of understand how he's doing this. And he, he's popping EVs north of 110. He has a home run at 114 already under his belt this year. He's a guy that's not even turned 22 yet and is an infielder and he's athletic. So if, if he can shore up some of the mechanical things that I think allow that cause him to get a little bit long to the ball, Campbell might be another another really fun prospect in, in, in a very talented Red Sox system offensively that may just be added to the fold here too. Well, and just on the MILB TV looks that I've seen of Christian Campbell, like he doesn't look like a, a thick guy at all. No. He looks like a, a longer, lankier, wiry guy hitting balls at 114, like several yes. baseballs at 110. That doesn't make much sense. You need to be an anomaly to do that. And he might be an anomaly. 132nd overall last year, outside the top 130. I mean, that's in the fact that you, I love that you mentioned the build because there's definitely room for more strength there. And if he's already doing that, mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot to dream on. Uh, Xavier Isaac, got to talk about him always. Rays prospect in high A, just waiting for him to get the promotion of double A. I know they've got a little bit of a log jam and the Rays do things the way the Rays do things. Last 20 games for Xavier Isaac, who's well inside of our top 50, he's actually a top 30 prospect for us. 342, 424, 671 slash line. It's a 1,095 OPS. Talk about a guy that puts up some major EVs. He's already hit home runs north of 470 feet this year. Uh, I mean, just light tower power. And he has not slowed down at all. If you look at the last 11 games, he's hitting 400. So we're talking about off the charts power, but a guy that just continues to mash consistently too. So I was talking to Chris Truby, who's one of the traveling coordinators for the Pirates, who will be at every home game for Indy, but then will use the road trips to either go with Indy or go to affiliates. And I was like, hey, you know, do you strategize kind of what places you go to based on where they're at? And he said, yeah, you know, when I saw Bo uh, Greensboro last, they were in Bowling Green. I said, oh, you got to look at Isaac. And he said, yeah, kid can swing it a bit, huh? <laughs> I love the underselling of baseball people. It's hilarious. And kid can swing it a bit is doing Xavier Isaac. Like, feels like a disservice, but that's like the highest compliment you could pay if if you've got a guy oh. that is bouncing around watching baseball game after baseball game. Oh, they loved. I, I think it's so funny. It's like, it's very, uh, it's like political almost in terms right. of like the way that they speak. It's like, I'm not going to commit to one way or another, but oh yeah, he's not bad, huh? Yeah. Uh, Two guys. 
two yeah, guys for you real quick. Um, a, because they kind of killed Indy, and B, because I think there is a spot for them. And we've been begging the Guardians to find more power. Begging, begging, begging. Manzardo has gotten off to a slow start. Will Brennan is running out there, and Will Brennan is OPSing like 640. Like Again, they're they're lacking impact. The Cleveland Guardians are lacking impact. They have two guys that can plug into a corner outfield spot and the DH spot, be a revolving door, and provide ample impact. Mm -hmm. Jonathan Rodriguez is a guy that got a little bit of a sample. And Jonathan Rodriguez in eight games in June, sitting 444, 16 for 36 with four homers, four doubles, drove in 16. He's got a 1364 OPS. He's got juice, man, and he's got juice to all fields. And the other guy is someone that I think everybody gave up on last year. Yeah. John Kenzie Noel can hit the living shit out of the ball. <laughs> and seeing him live, just I made sure to be at field level as often as I could for Columbus BP, just because I needed to like see the lower half to believe it. He is as fire hydrant as fire hydrant gets at six foot three. He's six three, two fifty. I mean, dude, he looks like an edge rusher that's going to go 1-1. One, one. Like, it's him and Aiden Hutchinson, man. And he hits the ball, what, I think he's popped a 118 mm -hmm. so far this year. He's ripped a couple 115s. He's a freak, man. And he can survive in a corner yeah. outfield spot. So it was funny when we do those those bonus uh, subscriber episodes for the call-up where we'll, we'll answer, you know, any questions from subscribers for the bonus episodes. One of the questions we got going into the year is like, I, I've, I have a lot of stock in Jenkins, you Noel, like cards and, and dynasty. Like, should, should I give up on him? Like, where are you guys at? And we both were like, Oh, like, you know, it's, it's definitely, uh, I could see it going either way, but you definitely shouldn't give up on him. Like he's not an afterthought by any means. He's 22 and getting his second taste of triple a. And here we are like, we've been begging him to cut down on the chase and he could still stand to cut down more on it. But I don't think it's a coincidence that over his last 20 games, he's cut his chase rate down by about six, 7%. Still way too high, but about by about six, seven percent. And over that stretch, he's slashing 413, 489, 738 with a 12% walk rate and a 13% K rate. This dude hits the living crap out of the ball. He makes more contact than you'd expect for somebody that's as powerful as he is. And I I, I do agree with everything that you're saying. I, I think he does get a chance at some point this year uh to, to potentially help the Guardians, especially because it, it, when you're seeing the adjustments and the things that are now going to translate more to big league success. And also the fact that this guy could just have an Aristides Aquino type of stretch where maybe it doesn't last, but you can bring him up there and he could be a shot in the ass just because of what he's capable of when he's hot. It's going to be worth a shot at some point. So I love that you mentioned both of those guys. And I just wanted to mention one or two others because you got James Triantos who had been mm -hmm. off to a bit of a slow start in the Cubs organization. And now he's heating up. I think Triantos, you can put him in the same bucket of a lot of guys that I think we're just struggling with the Southern league in general. It's all time low slugging percentage there. in that, in that double a South league. So uh, now Triantos though, over his last 15 games, OPSing over 800. And there's an outside chance that he gets an opportunity at the big league level. If they're still trying to canvas for, for infield options, I don't like the glove at third. So that's probably going to be the problem. But yeah. with Matt Shaw not performing at the best of his ability right now, I, I think it's probably far-fetched, but he's either going to play his way into a trade piece or you know he gets up to AAA, and if he lights it on fire, he's the type of guy that I think would have a much easier time in triple than he does in double right now, to be honest. Uh, what what Triantos is starting to do now with one of the better hit tools in the minor leagues and starting to hit the ball a bit harder, uh, he could be a guy that that pushes his way up to the upper minors or to AAA pretty quickly here. It's tough with the Cubs third base situation because again, Morell is the worst graded defender in major league baseball by fielding run value. They went and reselected David Bodie. He had cleared because of that contract and Bodie <laughs> been hanging out in Iowa for the last year and a half, but they went and added him because they realized they had the option. Nick Madrigal BJ Murray is the guy with prospect intrigue that has been playing some third base Murray started cold. He's gotten hotter. I don't love him defensively at third base. He can hold his own. I'm not sure if holding his own in AAA translates to being okay at the major league level, but Pickens are slim right now, and I think they placed a lot of eggs in the Shaw bucket coming into this year. I agree, and I'm very interested to see how they go about that as a result now. Still very, very high on Shaw, but I think it's clear that he's not going to be fast-tracked this year and help them win ball games. It's going to be and, a little bit more of a developmental process, which is okay. 
And I think they looked at Candelario and Matt Chapman and said, you know what? We're going to stay away because we feel like Shaw can get there this year. A hundred percent. But a guy, that can, a guy that can get to the, the the big leagues at third base, the last guy I wanted to mention was Jace Young. And, mm-hmm. and with the Tigers, there's probably going to be some space for him there, especially as they probably just sell off a couple of the pieces that you know, they, they can cash in on. But they got to make Young's Veerling an outfielder, man. He's not cracking any field with Veerling at third right now. Veerling's a dog right now. It's crazy. It, something's clicked for that guy. But last 10 games for Jace Young, 382, 563, 765 slash line. I mean, just ridiculous. He's walked 14 times and struck out five times in his last 10 games, but he's running into balls pull side. He's making more contact. He's a guy that's just had a good year all, all, all the way around. 928 OPS so far this season. Uh, Jace Young's definitely going to get a crack sometime soon this year. And it seems like he's starting to force their hand a bit more uh, multi home run game the other day and, and back-to-back games with, with multiple walks. So I think that that's pretty hard to, to, you know, push back on when you're doing that in triple a and then quick shout out to, to my buddy Griffin Cohen. who was just on the call up really fun conversation there with him. I mean, the stuff that he got into, you're just never going to really have any hitter get into because like we, we got a lot of the, uh, the, the intro out of the way, given that he's a friend. So he got really deep into it and we got to just let him go. I've honestly never heard him talk that much. So it was, it was really fun. And I mean, just little insightful things like guys, how guys are pitching O2 now and how different that is. Like there's yeah. just so many hitting insights that, that Griff provided, but beyond that, he is destroying baseballs. You got to see it up close and personal because you saw him hit his fifth home run in as many days. He's hitting 400 over his last 10 games with a 1332 OPS. And if you go over his last 30 games, I should have said Griffin Conine Marlins organization, by the yeah. way, he's going to get a crack this year. I, I really do think so. And, and it's things have definitely come together for him. Last 20 games, 358, 442, 791 slash line. Everyone loves to talk about the strikeout rate with him over his last 15 games. It's a 24% strikeout rate. So things are things are really starting to come together for Griffin. I'm really excited for him. Suck it, haters. Hitters of the week, games of the weekend. We'll do hitters of the week, but I am expanding beyond the week. We're going to do June to this point. So anywhere between 10 to 12 games that we're going to go with. There are seven guys in Major League Baseball that have played between between 10, between, I said between twice, that have played between 10 and 12 games that have an OPS over 1,100. Can you name any? Judge. Judge is the leader. He had a 14, let me see like the actual split for Aaron Judge. Uh, Aaron Judge in the month of May had... He hit 361 with a 1397 OPS in May. In June, in 10 games, Aaron Judge is hitting 486 with a 600 on base and a 1057 slug. So that's a 1657 OPS. 17 hits in 10 games in June, three doubles, a triple, five homers, driven in 17, punched six times in 45 plate appearances. Yeah, it's pretty good. He's the best player in baseball right now. Man. Yeah. Like, yes, and yes. and again, that title can keep changing. That's okay. Like DeGrom doesn't need to be the best pitcher in baseball all the time. DeGrom's hurt all the time. Trout yep. doesn't need to be the best player in baseball all the time. It was Acuna last year. It's always going to be Otani, but like best player in baseball right now is Aaron Judge because Otani's yep. not pitching. So we absolutely love it. He's number one by 300 points in the yeah. OPS department. Number that's- two is the only other guy that's over 1,300. 11 games, this guy's hitting 395, five homers so far in the month of June. Who is it? Uh, AL West. So I was, I was funny. I was going to go with Jammer Candelario as a guy that no. could be in that, in that match. Candelario is 10th. Candelario is a 1056 OPS. He's, I'm calling my shot here because going into the season real, real quick, not to take us aside because the answer is Jordan, I assume. The answer uh, is Jordan. Yeah. Uh, going into the year, I loved the fit for Candelario in Great American Small Park. And you see, I I was very conflicted, mostly sad because, you know, we love Tanner Bybee here. He's just one of the best interactions we consistently have. And he does a great job on his end of staying in touch with us. He's just just a great dude. So every time he's on the bump, I, I'm always rooting for him. But I also want to see the Reds succeed. He made a good pitch. And Jamer like stuck his bat out. It was a it, B swing might be selling it high. It was like a C swing. And, and he hit it out for a second home run of the game. Really, the only... That the only mistakes were 
pitching to Jamer Candelario essentially for for Bobby. But th- the idea that that power can really tick up in Great American Ballpark, I just want to call my shot here. I think Candelario keeps this rolling. I think he has a monster second half. But anyways, Jordan. Yes, Jordan's been balling, but Candelario, 11 games in June, 340 with five homers and 11 driven in. So he's really finding his stride. Jordan Alvarez, 11 games, slashing 395, 469, 907 in the month of June to this point. So Judge won, Alvarez two. Two guys in the NL West, three guys, four guys, four guys in the NL West are three, four, five, and six. Three, four. I don't know if Grichuk has played enough. He has not. Yeah, I figured. Uh, I know West. Shohei still in there? No, Shohei is not. I know West. Freddie? Freddie. Freddie Freeman is number three. He's got a 1294 OPS in 10 games. Okay, I know West sticking there, huh? Sticking there. Another Dodger. No, not Will Smith. Another Dodger, though. Another Dodger. Who just killed the Yankees? Honestly, I was traveling for a lot of that series. <laughs> you know it. If I if I say it, you're like, oh yeah, he did. Who just killed the Yankees? Yeah. Is it Tay Oscar? Yeah, we've got people in the car screaming. It's Tay Oscar. It's Tay Oscar. Tay Oscar Hernandez is sixth. Ten games in the month of June, hitting 300, five homers, 12 driven in, and 1128 OPS. Four and five, both NL West non-Dodgers. NL West non-Dodgers. And no, it's not Elliot Ramos. Elliot Ramos is eight. <laughs> Holy crap. That's wild. I know. I keep waiting for him to slow down. I don't want him to, but I keep waiting for it just out of assumption. No. Uh... Consistent phase for an underperforming team in the NL West. Consistent phase for an underperforming team in the NL West. Ketel Marte. Ketel Marte, 10 games, 389. Marte has a 1261 OPS in the month of June. The other guy started somewhat slow, but 12 games for San Diego, slashing 417, 481, 750. Not a superstar? Superstar. Oh, Tatis. Tatis. Tatis is fifth. Seventh is Gunnar Henderson, 11 games, 341 and 1124 OPS. So top seven, there's seven guys among qualified hitters in the month of June with an OPS over 1100. Aaron Judge at 1657, Jordan Alvarez at 1376, then Freddie Freeman, Cattell Marte, Fernando Tatis Jr., Teoscar Hernandez, and Gunnar Henderson. Rounding out the top 10, Elliot Ramos is eighth, Jaron Duran is ninth. Jamer Candelario is 10th. And Bobby Witt Jr. is 11th. I, that, what's fun Bobby. about this is you get the mixture of superstars and then guys that are just like heating up and get to give them a little bit of shine. I was hoping that Merrill might sneak his way in there, but it just, it was too much of, I think, just the last game. I don't think he's been doing it, but how about the two home run game for Merrill and clipping uh <laughs> fastball from Mason Miller? Uh, breaking I, ball from Mason Miller. Oh, breaking ball. Inside corner, he golfed it out. Oh, yeah, but- yeah, yeah. Multi-homer game from Donovan Solano and Jackson Merrill in that one. Like Solano, one... I, I remain that he is, I think, one of the most underrated players of our generation. Not <laughs> not because of, like, and I'm not even trying to be hyperbolic, because underrated from the lens of, like, he could barely find a minor league job, I feel like, <laughs> this past year. And he's hit, always hit all the time. There's so many teams that he would make better, like, immediately. I, that one I never understand. Uh, and then one last point I wanted to make before we go into the games of the week. Am I crazy for thinking that like Zach Neto is is getting like kind of overlooked too? Like I'm, I'm not that he's playing well and deserves more credit. That like I feel like people forget that Zach Neto has played less than 200 professional games. People That's including forget. the minor leagues. Yeah, people forget because there's a more extreme situation on his team like everybody moved their chips from the Neto basket to the Shanoel basket and it's all <laughs> shitting on Shanoel. Like these guys are gonna be fine. <laughs> like they're gonna be, I think, pretty good major. I think leaders. Neto's gonna legit be good. Like legit be a very solid player for a very long time. Uh, and I just wanted to like remind people that because I almost felt like I forgot it too. There's 162 games in a season. He's played like 190 in his <laughs> entire professional career, and it's not like he came from Vanderbilt or UF. No. He came from Campbell. He made the leap from Campbell, and the same thing with Shanwell. He made the leap from Boca Raton. Like 
I, it just, it's crazy to me. So I, I do want to just remind people Neto, like he's going to be a really solid player, I think. And like his development is, he, he should still be, there's a lot of prospects that I think have played within like, like Josue Paula has played almost as many professional games as, as Zach Neto. Matt no. Shaw has played almost as many professional games as Zach Neto. I think they're all about 20 to 25 games less. If I, if I remember correctly, like those are guys that, you know, we're, we're still talking about an ETA of, but for, for DePaula years and years, but like Shaw's looking like an ETA of next year. Like it's, it's just wild to me. I think sometimes we, we forget that, you know, we apply different levels of, of, I think logic uh, to, to different players. And, and sometimes it's unfair to them based on their circumstances and situation. Uh, because I, I do think that Neto can develop into a nice piece. Yeah. DePaula has played, I think 170 or 180, 174. Okay. And Neto has played 197. I think I have that right. Yeah, yeah. 197. I mean, like that's, like, that's crazy. That's comparable. That's that's a month of baseball. Crazy. All right, let's get to uh, games of the weekend here. And we start with a whale today. Tonight at 7.05 in Baltimore. Ranger Suarez against Kyle Bradish. Who you got? I got the O's. Okay. I got the, I just think this might be the game where, you know, the Phillies being uh, just banged up now where they haven't got the reinforcements back just yet. New catcher behind the dish. Uh, again, not new, but I, not JT and the, the Orioles having their best on the bump. I, I think they just edge them out. I can see it, but like, you got to remember Ranger is a one, eight, one ERA and he steps yeah. up in the big moments. Uh, Six 30 in Boston. Brian Bale hasn't been very good. Luis Heal has eight and one with a two Oh four at this point, but it's Heal and Bale. You just go Yankees and not think about it. Yeah. You got to go Yankees and not think about that one at all. Okay. Makes sense. Is that, is that going to be on national TV or, oh, I'm or sure. saving it it's, for Sunday night baseball? ESPN going to flex Sunday night to Friday night and Saturday night. Uh, please. I would love to see more of the, the best rivalry in sports. Tough. Um, all right. Cincinnati and Milwaukee, Hunter green, Freddie Peralta in Milwaukee. Green's actually been the better arm so far this year. I like I like the ball that the Reds are playing right now. Uh, give, give me Reds. Okay. 10-10 tonight in L.A. Cole Reagans against Gavin Stone. Stone's been throwing the ball pretty well. Last mm-hmm. time I checked in. He's got a sub three. Reagans at a 308. I think the Dodgers, this is a get-right series. And not that they've been, like, wrong, but... I think they really flex their muscles in this one. Okay. I can get behind that. Uh, let's go Saturday at 410 in Houston. Jack Flaherty in the Tigers against Justin Verlander in the Astros. In Houston. In Houston. If it was in Detroit, I'd say Verlander and the, they should be minus 500 by our friends at BetMGM. Because <laughs> anytime that guy pitches there, it's an auto win uh, and, and usually 10 Ks. But uh, the Astros, they're starting to swing it a little bit more. But they no already Tucker. sent, yeah, and, and no little Profito. They already sent him back down, Which so I'm going to fade them until oblivion. Who did they? Who did like the? I I saw a name that I had never seen before. I I already forgot. Came. I I forgot. I it, that was just so pissed. <laughs> My option. <laughs> I'm going to go find it. There's actually another name that I saw. Oh, this is actually something that I wanted to mention a little bit earlier. The Colorado Rockies have snuck the first game by me or the first name by me this year that I had never seen before. And it was yeah. reliever, um, Angel Chivili. Do you know who this never, is? Never heard of him. Angel Chivili, twenty-one-year-old right-handed reliever, made four appearances out of the Rocky bullpen to this point. Looking at the minor league numbers, this guy got up from Double A Hartford, had a two-five ERA in eighteen innings last year. Fifty appearances with High A Spokane had a five-eight. And then three appearances with double A. Angel Chavilli is a major leaguer for the Colorado Rockies. Rockies, they make dreams come true, man. Speaking of, Adel Amador is two for 14 with five Ks to start his big league career instead of just staying hot in double A and being on our prospect report. Tough eat, man. Oh, we got to go back. Rays just announced their starters tonight at 720. Littell and Sale in Atlanta. Rays Braves. Littell and Sale. Uh, I do sale sale look great. He bounced right back. I'll, I'll go, I'll go Braves, but man, like 
these are two teams that have just been so underwhelming. I th- that this is gonna be one of those series where two underwhelming teams match up and you find out who is the more underwhelming team. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I think the Rays are gonna let us know it's them. Got you. All right. So Saturday, should I even ask you about Ryan Pepio and Charlie Morton? That's kind of fun. No. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the pitching edge back to, I don't know. Cause Pepio does this every other start thing. So yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't really know. I have uh, no idea. No, I prediction. haven't kept track of the pendulum either. So I I've got no idea. How about nine, 10 though? Hell of a pitching matchup. I mean, I'm locked into uh Reagan's and stone on Friday on Saturday night at nine, 10 Eastern Seth Lugo and Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Ooh, I know. Yoshi. You know, she keeps looking good, man. I know he does. Uh, you know, he's on Hall of Fame watch, right? He is on Hall of Fame watch. What, 15 years at a 2-8 ERA? <laughs> That'd be an unreal. <laughs> That'd be unreal. Uh, I'll go I'll go the Dodgers and Yoshi. Okay. You know, he averaged 97 with his heater last time out. Dude, that was in New Up York. from 95-6. When I think he the went... adrenaline was going for him a little bit. Oh, my God, yeah. That was in New York, right? Or was that – yeah, that was in New York. In New York, but it was electric there, obviously. Um, I Just seeing the clips that I was able to see when I was traveling, just like uh, Dodgers fans out there, the atmosphere, all that good stuff. But I also – like it almost made me think, this guy might be pacing himself a little bit for the rest of the year, knowing it's it's a marathon here. And that's where it's even more scary, like – he might just keep getting better and better and better. And by the time we get to the end of the year, he might be carrying them, you know, in the postseason. He might be that guy for them. Glass now could be that, but like there might be a level of trust with with Yoshi. So I'm excited to see how he builds off of that yeah. uptick and, and see where, where it goes. I'm totally with you. Let's jump to Sunday. I'm kind of fascinated by this game, like in terms of picking a winner. Drew Thorpe in start number two, he looked good in start mm-hmm. one against Jordan Montgomery, who's been really <laughs> bad in Arizona. Like, who wins between the White Sox running out Thorpe and the Diamondbacks running out Montgomery? I mean, you, you have to win that game if you're the Arrows on a Diamondbacks. But you at this have point, to. but at this point, like it's been so rough. Uh, Thorpe's changeup is so good that it works right on right. But you know, I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of good matchups in that lineup for him. I think I think the D-backs win that one, and I think this is a confidence builder for Montgomery, where you can just say, okay, I'll, even if my stuff hasn't been there all year, I'm going to attack the zone, and the White Sox ain't beating me. So yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll fade the White Sox on that one. I can see that. All right, better pitching matchup, Lugo and Yamamoto, or actually, we have three phenomenal pitching matchups. Friday night, tonight, Ranger Suarez, Kyle Bradish. Saturday night, Seth Lugo, Yoshinobu Yamamoto. And then Sunday afternoon, Zach Wheeler against Corbin Burns in Ooh. Baltimore. Name value, I'd go with with Wheeler, Burns, and just, just the matchup of teams. I think th- that's one that I'm just naturally going to want to put on more, more likely because it's also two just buzzsaw offenses too that, you know, it's like a great challenge for both arms. Yeah. But I think like on paper, it's Lugo, Yamamoto. Lugo, Yamamoto. Right? Suarez and Bradish. I think Suarez and Bradish. Suarez, Suarez and Bradish. I think Suarez and Bradish from a statistical, like best performer standpoint, I think is the the best matchup. But in you intrigue know. is Lugo Yamamoto. And then, but then I think name level value. of just name value and like should be on national TV. Give me, give me the Wheeler uh, Burns matchup. Guess what games on national TV instead of, of Wheeler and Burns? Ruin my day. What is it? Marcus Stroman and Cutter Crawford, baby. You're you're fucking with me. I'm not fucking with you. Can they flex that shit out? Nope. On that note, go get your merch. Click on every link in the episode description and uh, have fun watching Sunday Night Baseball. We're going to watch the afternoon slate instead. Arm, parting words? No. See you guys. Have a good weekend.